Hi, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. Life will come up slightly. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society. Uh, and uh, you, it is my pleasure for this is, we've done these events many times over the years. We've been in sort of in business for around 18 years now at, at Folks. Uh, and Floyd Abrams has been one of our most repeated guests. Um, and we're so happy now to partner with the JCC of Manhattan. Uh, we're going to do more events with them. So tonight was just a perfect uh, marriage of ideas and art and culture. Just to give you a sense of how many things that we've done with Floyd, we uh, showed, we had showed, sometimes we show movies like uh, the Dustin Hoffman film Lenny about Lenny Bruce. We showed that film and we had Floyd and Nadine Strassen, who was at that time the president of the ACLU. Uh, we had uh, uh, the Deborah Lipstadt case, the libel case uh, in Germany against the historian Holocaust denial, uh, David Irving. That movie was called Denial. We had Floyd for that. Uh, we had uh, uh, we had a film in which Floyd is actually in the movie as a judge, nothing but the truth, and that was fun. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, oh, this was cool. We, the 25th anniversary of the Hustler case, remember the Hustler magazine against Jerry Faldwell? Uh, we did that case. We had Jerry Faldwell uh, in a wheelchair shortly before he died. I remember F Floyd and I had a blast that night. We had it was Floyd, and, and, La and it was this, the celebration of the 25th anniversary of that case before the Supreme Court. I can also just, that's a lot of Floyd Abrams, and now we're going to get to talk to him again. I should also tell you that in my last book, which is a book about the First Amendment, Floyd and I don't necessarily agree on all things, but he is an old friend, so he gave a blurb for the book. And the book essentially says, you should buy this book, but you should listen to nothing that he says. <laughs> So it was useful because people would buy it, but he's saying don't listen to anything he says. So we'll <laughs> point out why that is. So uh, first let's bring out Floyd Abrams. <laughs> Floyd, we're going to put you in the middle. Okay. And also, since we also much enjoyed uh, this film, uh, Yael, Malamed, right? Malamed, do I have it right, Yael? There she is, the director, Yael. And I, actually, I think you're here. Yeah, there we go, sorry. Um, okay, welcome, great film. I'm gonna start with Yael. You think I'd start with Floyd? I'm gonna start with Yael, and I'll tell you why. This was an American Masters film, and for those of you who've been watching American Masters on PBS, you know that normally, it's a recognition of cultural achievement, right? And you see people like, you know, Bob Hope or Cole Porter or Yitzhak Perlman or Quincy Jones. And this is a, and by the way, I, I don't think I told you, I actually uh, co-produced uh, American Masters on the mill filmmaker, Sidney Lumet. Um, and so this, however, is very different uh, because this is really about an idea and about one man's lifetime commitment and devotion to defending that idea. So as a filmmaker, and by the way, I, I didn't, should have told you, I buried the lead on her, gave, gave, gave a, a press term on Yael. She's an Academy Award winning uh, documentary filmmaker. And so you should know that. She's not just anyone. She's like a Floyd Abrams. Um, and we should say, I'm just saying, she now is added to a list of other folks, guests that we've had over the years. We've had Sidney Lumet and Peter Bogdanovich and Barry Levinson and, and uh, Robert Benton and Yael. Uh, so Yael, tell us the cinematic idea, because you made a cinematic film about a guy and an idea, and he doesn't dance and he doesn't play music, uh, but you have great archival footage. Is that something that you thought of when you were thinking, I gotta make a film about the First Amendment and Floyd Abrams, how am I gonna make that interesting? Um, it's a loaded question. Uh, so first of all, I am no Floyd Abrams, but I aspire uh, to be Floyd Abrams uh, in what I do. But I love that we got to work with American Masters. I thought it was such a perfect title for a lawyer and for someone who's a master of his craft that is around an idea. But I think it's similar to being a great composer or a great artist. It just looks a little different. Um, so that was 
kind of, I, I love the idea, and I, I in general, um, am attracted to films about ideas. That it, those can be scary, but I think they can be really interesting. Um, I had talked to Floyd, actually, after f during the process of um, working on a series about hate, and we started talking a lot about hate speech. Um, and through that process, I got really interested in the First Amendment, and so wanted to do something around our history of the First Amendment that we think goes so far back, but in fact was much more recent than I think I knew even as a student of American history in college. So that was the beginning. And then it just seemed like everything that we were dealing with in society had some side to it having to do with speech. And so it just seemed like a way to talk about where we're at without getting into right or wrong or um, stupid or, or smart. And so that was the genesis and we started talking about it. and. That's what led to the Well, film. when Yael said, we're talking about where we're at, you should all know, to us, the purpose of a Folks event is that we're really, the film is a, is a, in, a way to introduce larger issues that are happening where we're at right now. So we're not going to go over what we discussed in the film. You already saw the film. We're going to actually talk about where we're at now and how Floyd sees that from a First Amendment perspective. One idea that I think is implicit in the movie, but not explicit enough, which is that you have Floyd Abrams championing the principle of free speech. But what we, and, and because he's on all sides and, and consistent, what may be not clear to all of you is that he's on the side of the angels where he has an enormous advantage, an enormous advantage, and the reason is because unlike other Western democracies, the United States is much more free speech oriented than any other country. And so we, don't, we say, well, look at this, you know, he's this crusade. He is a crusader. He's killing it. But he's on the side of the founding fathers. And he and I, you know, have disagreed about some of these things. Like, for instance, the Europeans don't let Nazis march on a town of Holocaust survivors. They think you're out of your. They think we're out of our minds. In Germany or in Austria, an Aust, uh, the Nazis get marched straight to jail. You want to march? We'll take you straight to jail. Uh, cross burnings in the United States, slavery, Jim Crow. You can actually have a political position that's articulated by burning a cross. Now, Floyd is listening to me, and he knows, he actually says, yes, that's right, exactly, those are, those are First Amendment rights. That's political speech. Uh, a number of years ago, the Supreme Court ruled on a case in which a man was burying his son. He was a, a, two, a veteran of two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and there's a church in Kansas that protests, this is Snyder versus Phelps, they protest gays serving in the military. So they go to military funerals and they hold up signs, God hates fags, and other signs. And the father sued uh, the church, and the church won, eight to one. Free speech is something that liberals and conservatives often agree on. Again, eight to one. I, I think that opinion on the church with the father's last opportunity to say goodbye to his son, I think it's outrageous that it was eight to one. Just this summer, the Supreme Court in two different cases, nine to zero, ruled against Google and Facebook and especially YouTube to say, well, if you, you know, a family lost their daughter uh, uh, to a hailstorm of bullets with an ISIS terrorist attack in Paris, they sent the girls to study abroad. She never came back. And the parents sued YouTube and said, you make it possible for terrorists to talk to each other. You make it possible for them to make bombs out of their kitchens. And clearly, there's anti-terrorism laws. You should be responsible for that. Not in America. In Europe, they don't let you do that. In the United States, nine to zero, both cases were ruled in favor of, of the speech principles of the social media companies. So Floyd, with that wind up, which I'm not sure everyone knew, uh, what makes us so special that we would, we would see free speech in ways that other democracies wouldn't? Uh, we are special uh, in the way that you that, that you identify. Um, it didn't really have to work out that way. 
uh, at least in the in general very strong support very very strong support even in the cases that you cite uh, uh, of the First Amendment uh, and in, in fact chance had a lot to do with it so you uh, said chance chance mm -hmm. and the chance was who was on the Supreme Court when the First Amendment uh, started to be challenged and or proffered as a basis for, for protecting really unpopular and sometimes damaging uh, speech. I mean, a great deal of the First Amendment protection is during the lifetime of uh, a fourth of this audience and within the lifetime of mine. Not, not all my cases, but cases in the starting really in the 1960s, the 1970s, started to move very strongly in the direction of more protection for uh, speech. You, why is that, though? I mean, well, it's, part it, of it was that the national press couldn't cover the mistreatment of black Americans uh, and what was going on in the South. There, were, there, there was, as one of the uh, right. people in the film said, the, the New York Times Council said, there was a major effort in the South to prevent coverage of what was going on there. Uh, and the court, you can use your own adjectives, but the court changed the meaning of the First Amendment or had the first chance to really look at the First Amendment in a situation like that. What, what, what could it really be that Southern all white juries could put the New York Times out of business? That was something that was a real possibility. Uh, but what about and if that if, and if that seemed to be a credible risk, newspapers would stop covering it, which is what the 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 South then wanted to do. So, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the the big cases. I'm not limiting it to my cases, but a lot of the really big cases arose in the last uh, 60, 70 years. Uh, and they arose because of what was happening in the country in those years and who was on the Supreme Court in that year. But that said, it's not all chance. I mean, the framers of the Constitution really did care about preserving individual rights in a way that transcended the rights that had existed in England. Some of those rights were were sent across the ocean. But others, the framers wanted more <laughs> but, because but, they had been suppressed. They had been unable to speak out. They're the ones and their successors had wound up in jail until we had a revolution and until we had a constitution and the constitution had a bill of rights with a very broadly interpreted First Amendment. So that, I mean, that's a, just a very broad way of saying how we got to be quite so different as uh, many of the other democratic uh, countries in the world. And another thing is that we have come not to trust our legislature to, to make a lot of the decisions which relate to speech, not to trust them because we think that they may take it away. Uh, I mean, speaking for myself, looking into the future, I mean, if we have a Donald Trump succession, I think we will be so relieved for a moment, uh, relieved that we have at least a vibrant level of First Amendment protection in which people can speak out and the government will not be empowered to suppress that speech, because I think that's what might otherwise happen. So that's not because of me, but there were a lot of cases in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s in particular, a number of which I was fortunate enough to be involved with, uh, in which there was a, a, you know, a very strong First Amendment position to be articulated. But and, 
but but the point though is that, and you you say it in the film that we're talking about the preservation of political speech as having a primary emphasis that the founding fathers were concerned about. So, for instance, in the film, in Yael's film, you set the date at 1919 was where we start to have, and this is during World War I, this is about the Espionage Act, which I wish we had time, maybe at the end I'll talk about that, because I think there's such an irony that Yael started with the Espionage Act, because the Espionage Act is something that I know Floyd thinks is a horrible law, uh, but it is also the law that's being used against Donald Trump in Florida. So for those of you who hate Donald Trump, you think the Espionage Act is a great law. But hi historically, people, you know, ACLU people have always thought it's an overbroad law. It makes you an enemy of the state very easily. But at some point, like for instance, you know, a case that you didn't work on, Cohen versus California, where, you know, if you were opposed to the draft, a guy wore a jean jacket in the back and said, fuck the draft. He went into a government building and he was arrested in California and Supreme Court ultimately said, no, no, he has the right to say that. He supposed it's political speech. So again, something happened in the 60s and 70s where the court got involved and said, no, if you want to say something political, even if it means you're going to, if you remember, Skokie, Illinois, for whatever reason, in the 1970s had the highest concentration of Holocaust survivors anywhere. <laughs> Other outside of Israel, even more so than Brooklyn, as a per capita basis. And so to actually say in 1977 is what, 25 years after Auschwitz? It's outrageous that they were able to get a permit and the ACLU, represented by Jewish lawyers, <laughs> got the rights for them to do that. So obviously, I just think we should, I'd like you to maybe explain a little that we are radically different and it is, a f focus is really on political speech. If you have something political to say, you can burn a cross on a black family's lawn. Well, first, the law is a little more complex than that. It really is. Well, uh, the true uh, threats uh, uh, changes that and, and I want to talk about that too. Yeah, but, but uh, the, uh, the, the Skokie case, uh, to my mind, is not at all the way it is to yours. Uh, the Skokie case is a remarkable affirmation of the willingness of this country to allow coarse, venal, harmful speech to be articulated. And why do we do it? Why do we allow that to happen? Because we know from history, our own and other countries, that if you allow the government to make that decision, those sorts of decisions, they'll make it in their own interest. They'll make it in the interest of the state uh, rather than the people. And, and the First Amendment at its best and most important is a protection from the government for the people. Sometimes of terrible speech, and not just terrible, but harmful speech. That, that we've basically chosen, in general, uh, to run the risks, and they're real, the risks of allowing, uh, almost authorizing, uh, harmful speech to avoid what, what we have determined so far in our history that the First Amendment has decided, which was that as a general proposition, we will not allow the government to do that, to make those distinctions, to decide who's worthy of speaking and who unworthy, except in some you know, very extraordinary cases. But, but you're quite right. I mean, we're almost alone uh, in protecting hate speech. In Canada, great democratic country, they celebrate the fact, they're proud of the fact that, that People who engage in hate speech go to jail well, in, the, in this great democratic country. Well, uh, most people don't know, I think, I don't, even in a New York audience, sophisticated, that the United States actually doesn't have hate speech laws. We just don't have it. They do in Canada, they do all throughout the Western right. Europe, but we just don't have it. And so, for instance, we know it was mentioned in the doc, Yael's documentary. Speech is not in, unlimited. There are some things that you can't, you know, libel, perjury. You mentioned, Yael mentions fighting words in the true threats doctrine. But just to bring it to something that is much more relevant to today, uh, the questions about Donald Trump's, uh, it, the incitement of an insurrection, 
right? Or for that matter, from the river to the sea in, in Columbia or NYU. In your mind, right, if, if you know that there are these exceptions to the free, free speech principle, one is fighting words, another is true threats, right? There, we haven't seen it yet because this is just happening in real time, right? But trust me, this could, you might be, you're, you're, you're here at the right moment to hear this conversation. Why? Because if you receive federal funding from a university and they stop you from staying from the river to the sea, right? If they try to stop you, that's a First Amendment violation. On the other hand, is it incitement? Is it a true threat? that when Jews walk on campus, that that's what they're seeing. And so I'm just curious, just to give it a, a real, not just historic context, but a very timely context. Uh, the, remember, the case in Washington, D.C. against Donald Trump is not an insurrection or incitement case. People think it is, but it's not. Everyone called it the insurrection case. But they actually didn't bring incitement charges against Donald Trump in, in that federal case. It's confusing. And there was a reason for that, I think, is because Floyd would say, because as much as you might hate Donald Trump, whatever he said at the ellipse that day does not constitute incitement. I mean, our law does, does not treat that uh, as incitement. That we, we do have a body of incitement law, but it's got to be much firmer, clearer, uh, unambiguous than other democratic countries do. Uh, and uh, I think that's a good thing. What about the now, river, river to the sea? Is that a truth that, when you said before, when you stopped me and you said, it's not quite a simple thing about your, your cross burning, why? Because the last Supreme Court case on cross burning said, well, if there's a true threat that's being presented, then, you, then the, an ordinance that would restrict uh, uh, cross burnings might be constitutionally protected. So I wonder, do you consider that? Look, a tr I think that if they said what they mean, which is Israel should not exist, that's protected speech. But and it, and indeed, it, that's protected speech in more countries than ours. Indeed, in some countries, it's so protected that they go a lot farther than that. But there are people but, that are saying from the river to the sea actually also means no Jews and they have to be eliminated. Yeah. And, and so, so we have to make that decision. And we have to make a decision about where, and whether it matters, where and by whom that, that sort of deep, uh, offensive doesn't begin to say it, but deeply outrageous speech uh, can, can be voiced. Uh, college campuses. There are there are hard issues, even under our law, about what's allowed and what's not allowed. How far uh, the uh, college campuses, the colleges, can go? Because remember, two colleges have an obligation. And people forget this to educate, uh, and 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 that being so, one one can make certain educational decisions uh, about what what's allowed and what's not allowed, but the more political the speech is, and I'm not talking now about you know, a gun to the head, but the more political it is, the more it is taking a position uh, about Israel, uh, about the Arab states, about, you pick it. Pick the most controversial sort of uh, uh, case that you, that you can think of. Uh, the more we tend to protect it. That doesn't mean you can commit espionage because you believe it would be good to help some foreign country. It doesn't mean that you can commit murder because you think, uh, or, or someone else can commit murder uh, be because you know, the world would really be better uh, without that person. We, we, we have lots of laws which limit what people can do. Where we've gone, though, because of the lessons we think we've learned as a people about not trusting government to limit speech is to allow more speech uh, and, and to limit the government uh, in barring it, let alone punishing it. Now, what happens to an Assange case 
uh, he's, he's going to be tried this year. I mean, I'm, I have written very critical things about him and about uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, and I've written that he, he hasn't behaved like a journalist. He shouldn't be viewed as a journalist. Uh, I, I've written that he has, he has risked enormous harm, including to the lives of people he identified, uh, who we, our ambassadors around the world, promised would not be revealed. And when he obtained these documents, he just let them all out. Didn't even, didn't even read them. Made them available immediately to press and institutions that, with which he wanted to be, or he wanted his organizations to be associated. But that doesn't answer the question of whether these violated the law. And, and it doesn't answer the question of how far we want or should want our Espionage Act to go <coughs> in areas in which there's a good deal of political impetus, not Democrat, Republican, but impetus about what, why are you saying this, why are you releasing the, this information? And, uh, you know, I, I am as pained uh, uh, as you are about much of the speech that we protect. What I'm not pained by is that we protect it. What I'm pained by is that it is said and that we don't succeed enough uh, in dealing with well, it. Well, you're also making the argument that the Skokie lawyers, the ACLU, many of them were Jews, saying, look, I don't have to love these Nazis. I, I understand who they are, and I know they would want me dead, but that doesn't mean I don't represent them. I'm pained by what they think, but I still defend the First Amendment principles. So let, let's go back to the, the ACLU lawyers, because I think we're in a very interesting time to have this conversation, because um, the law still is with you and your understanding of the First Amendment, but the culture is not with you anymore. And I wonder whether you feel betrayed by some entities like, you know, like the ACLU, because remember in Charlottesville, the, Charlottesville was represented by the, the, the alt-right, was represented by the um, ACLU. And many people don't know, if you think about it, it's just like Skokie, but what people don't know is that after the, what happened in Charlottesville, 200 ACLU lawyers wrote a letter to the director and said, what the hell are we doing? Why are we representing these thugs? We shouldn't be. And we should be interested in things like equity and equality. And I think this was a surprise for people like you and others that have been warriors of the First Amendment to say, what do you mean, why do we care about them? Because we fight for the right to make those speeches and to march. So I'm wondering, similarly, liberals and progressives are much more willing to censor books or censor ideas because they want to protect marginalized communities. And I'm wondering whether you're watching this with an eye toward where are you all going? You're, you're essentially violating the First Amendment. Well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that, that people who care deeply about matters of public policy and, and significant matters of public policy sometimes cross what I think, and right now at least the Supreme Court thinks, is the line uh, about what, what is and what is not protected speech. I mean, they're human. Uh, I don't just mean they're human, so they're wrong. I mean, they, they care about the consequences of terrible, dangerous, threatening speech, some of which we protect for the broader reasons that I've identified earlier, which was we simply are not prepared to empower the government to make those decisions. And we sort of hold our breath and hope that, that the public will be smart enough to deal with it or sleepy enough not to adopt it uh, in one way or another. Yeah, but the problem is that they may not want to take those cases anymore. 
that they're literally saying, I'm not, I'm going back to the same point. I think you're despicable, but I'm, I'm an ACLU lawyer, so I'm prepared to represent, to protect your right to speak. I'm wondering whether you're saying, yeah, we don't like these people, but I, we're, I'm just, I'm wondering whether you're saying, I'm distressed that you want to give up that, that part of what we think civil liberties mean. Not too much. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm not laughing, really not at, at, your, at your question. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we would not collapse as a nation if we, if we were somewhat less civil liberties oriented in certain areas. They're, these are hard calls that, that have to be made again and again and again. Uh, and that, that we come out one way with, with a few different Supreme Court justices and another way with different ones on some issues where I think <laughs> the issues are difficult. So and, and, and there are serious claims that can be made that we've gone too far maybe uh, about this aspect of, of that. The, where, where what I think it's important to bear in mind is, is that the rule has to be, ought to be, and so far has been, a level of legal protection which has been unknown, un, 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 unfollowed anywhere in the world but here. I think we should be very proud of that. Uh, and if sometimes you know, the situation gets, what, so dangerous that an espionage act that I think has, is too loose and too easy to use to suppress speech is needed for the purpose of prosecuting someone, I mean, that's fine with me. I mean, I, I don't defend espionage. One of the problems with the Espionage Act is that it, it isn't limited to, other, to espionage, or sometimes it, it isn't so, so limited. So I, I don't lose my own what, faith in, in the system working out because there are some decisions that go this way or that way or some ACLU lawyers who can't stand anymore what they're doing. I, I, you know, I, I get that, uh, and particularly in areas in which we give more protection than anywhere in the world. Uh, if we gave a little bit less protection, you know, I might think that's not a good idea, but I'd probably think it wasn't a good idea, not because of the specific cases they would get, but because it would be a first step uh, and particularly in a more repressive time to, to limiting rights that all of us would say uh, ought to be protected and limiting speech that all of us would, would hope uh, would be protected. Well, in, the, in Yael's film, it comes up really well and it's subtle, but it's where you hear a number of the lawyers questioning Floyd Abrams and why is he defending commercial speech through corporations yeah. and the influence that money has on our elections? And secondly, why is he protecting companies that use artificial intelligence that violate our privacy rights? And they're looking at this. You, you might look at them and say, because I'm defending speech. This is what I do. Haven't you followed my career? This is what I do. And they're looking at you and saying, yeah, but you know, these are not lefty, liberal, progressive values. You're on the other side. Yeah, but those aren't my values. Those are the values you long ago rejected. I understand that. But, but I, I have different values. One of them is there's a confession. It's nice to have clients. Right? <laughs> and, and if someone comes to me in an area that I don't know much about, like artificial intelligence, and says, well, what do you think? You think there might be a First Amendment argument that this is protected? And I think, and if I think there is, as I do think there is, I'm, I'm happy to represent it. That, that doesn't become the banner I wear on my forehead. Right, but you don't feel betrayed by the people that were once your colleagues who all agreed on the same thing on how to apply the First Amendment and now all of a sudden are complaining because oh. they don't like the way money is used in elections and they don't like 
the way technology is used to violate people's privacy. Uh, the, look, the money issue to me is a lot as a as a close question for a lot of different reasons. But uh, you know, I mean, they, we, I don't think we would be without liberty if the money issue came out a different way. I think I think it it's the wrong decision. Uh, not just in terms of impact, but the wrong decision in terms of living in a society in which more speech is protected. But, but, that, but that we can have areas in which the speech is what? So potentially harmful that, that we go and ban it, and there's a pretty good First Amendment argument that you shouldn't be allowed to ban it, and there's a not bad argument at all that, that things have gotten to a stage that we really ought to be allowed to. I mean, I, I don't just pull out my constitution and read it. Uh. <laughs> so uh, I want to get to an area of the cancellation culture. And I think we'd be interested in hearing something about that. Uh, also, I don't think it's, it's not clear the dominance of this man in his field. You represented, I think, the New York Times for th over 30 years, right? Uh, yeah, 1971. They never lost a libel case with Floyd Abrams. Just to give you a sense of, again, how free speech oriented uh, a country we are and how good he is. Uh, no, well, let, me, let me add, too, it's, it, it, f f further to my point that it's not just what the law is. The New York Times, for far, far more of the years than I've been alive, has had a no settlement policy. They don't settle libel cases. They haven't and they don't. You're saying even in the 19th century. And that century. doesn't mean that they think everything that they published must be defensible. They, their predecessors were of the view that, that, that it's a cost of doing business, but not a cost they're prepared to pay in terms of settling cases to defending what they've done as best they can. And if they lose, they go on. Now, they don't lose libel cases uh, for a lot of reasons, mostly because the journalism isn't usually even close uh, to, to not being protected uh, either on truth or some other basis. But, but you know, this, this is, uh, you know, different, different institutions have different uh, policies about what they do. M most publications, and I would say this is likely to increase in amount, most publications, if, if they've said something which is indefensible, now I mean legally indefensible, not true and not avoidable, yeah, we'll go and settle the case. Mm -hmm. They are, after all, still corporations in America that want to avoid risk at some point. The Times and some other entities have, have a, this flat rule that I've talked about, uh, but not everyone has it. But the important thing to me is that the law be, as it right now is, extremely protective of journalism. And sometimes that will mean some bad journalism is protected, uh, but more often it will mean, particularly with a paper that cares about accuracy, more often it, it will be that they don't have to pick up the phone and call lawyers who are by their, na by, by their nature cautious, careful, protective. The easy answer is don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you thought you had to call me, don't do it. Right. And that's not the way that the press at its best behaves. So the First Amendment, when clear in Yael's film, First Amendment only gets triggered if the government censors you or restricts or restricts, restrains your speech. But now we have something in the broader culture, the cancellation culture, in which people have lost jobs, have had reputations ruined, have been banished from society in ways that do not violate the First Amendment because the government's not doing it, we're doing it to them. So I wonder whether, again, this is off the track of the pure First Amendment analysis. Are you of the view that as a nation, not legally, but even morally, that we've lost this impulse 
to just be protective of speech and to be tolerant of speech that we disagree with and be able to be, you know, I heard you, I disagree with you, and I will go away and think about it as opposed to, and I will destroy your career because you said something at a Shabbat dinner that I really don't like, and I am never going to have my children play with your children. And I wonder whether you're looking at this, not legally, but culturally, and saying, what the hell's going on that people are being published, punished for speaking? Uh, yes, to the extent that I think, for one thing, people are less willing than they used to be to simply move on. Hmm. Somebody says something, it's critical. You know, you don't have to be friendly with everybody. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be a lifetime grudge. Uh, yeah, but do, do I think we as a people are sort of uh, what, uh, you know, uh, nearly hysterical too often? Sure. Uh, and willing to restrain speech. Well, to restrain it, I'm not sure what, what you mean by restrain speech. Well, I can't I, believe you said that. I'm never talking to you again. I think there are things that if people said that, you ought to say just that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's, let's get to Facebook for a second. Uh, and then I'll, we'll take some questions from the audience. We'll say goodnight. Um, I want to talk about Facebook because I know that you believe that, and I, so do I, by the way, the Founding Fathers believed in representative democracy and they liked the concept of public squares where people would get up on a soapbox and have a discussion and try to influence others for the purposes of making, have maybe influencing government to make better decisions that we're all better off if we hear ideas in a marketplace of ideas. I know you believe that, I believe that. The problem is that we don't have soapboxes anymore. Everything is on social media and there are these algorithms and they curate the people, by the way, who lost that case for the Supreme Court, the families that, that their daughter was killed in a terrorism strike in Paris. I just mentioned that earlier. What they said in, in the Supreme Court is to say, it's not benign what YouTube does, because it, they use the algorithm to say, if you seem to like terrorism, we're going to give you all the terrorism things. We're going to curate it to give you all of the things that you want. So it's not just a matter of you searching for something. We're going to help you. We're going to help you find what you want. And I wonder whether you think that Facebook, because it's not like a soapbox, and because they have the ability to present things on people's feed, that it, isn't, it doesn't get the same kind of First Amendment protection because it's not neutral. It's not content neutral. The print press has never been content neutral. Right. Ever. Uh, I do think that social media ought to get broadly the same level of legal protection that the print press does. Um, uh, I've thought that for some time. That is before the Supreme Court now. And the Supreme Court will pass upon it uh, in this term. So on two cases, uh, right? Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, so we have, you know, we've, we've long since decided as a legal matter about the print press that no matter how unfair it is, unless it lies about someone, that it's legally protected. Um, uh, unfairness is not a legal concept. Um, and so they, the print press plays up this guy, down that guy. Uh, that's, that's all protected speech. It may be, it may be awful, or it's it, it, it certainly sometimes worthy of uh, a criticism. But one of the great cases, also from the 1970s, uh, the Supreme Court said in a case where you could really make, and, and people did, a nice argument to the contrary, that when Florida passed a law saying that if a newspaper attacks a candidate for public office, at a time close to an election, he ought to have a chance to respond, right? He ought to have a chance to respond in the place that made the charge against him, the critical comment. 
The newspaper said, supported by people like me, but the newspaper said, what? It said, editing is for editors. <laughs> it said, that's a quote from the Supreme Court. Uh, it said that it's the newspapers to decide what to print. Uh, and we don't trust the government to get involved in that. Uh, so, yeah, we understand why Florida is taking it at its best, you know, assuming it's not political in, in what I'm talking to you about. Uh, you know, Florida had, had said, you know, this candidate, Pat Torneo, is running for mayor of, in Miami, I think, the, the, uh, the, the, the single largest paper in the city, in the state, blasts him in a way that he thinks is unfair, and he wants to answer. And they don't give him the space. They don't do it. Period. And the court made the decision, which I think is one of our great First Amendment decisions, is that the legislature can't get involved with that. That that is what free speech is all about, is letting the speakers decide, including, the, the, in that case, the dominant newspaper of Florida, because what we've learned from around the world is once the government starts down that road, the freedom is truly uh, at risk. Now, I think the same thing about social media. I think allowing the government to, to start getting involved except on an antitrust-like basis, how much power, you know, uh, not enough marketplace uh, availability, but, but letting the government make, make decisions about whether uh, you know, hate speech ought to be allowed or not is just the sort of thing that we can trust the government least about. Uh, and the fact that they might be able to draft a statute which looks pretty fair uh, on the face of it, uh, it doesn't pass muster. That, that we, we have almost a, a you, I don't want to say hysterical, but compulsive uh, uh, fear of falling prey to what so many countries have, where we wind up with a, a government-controlled free speech area, government-controlled press, government-controlled decision-making about who can say what, uh, even though there will be cases, of course there will be cases, where the newspaper has behaved terribly. Now, in the case of that, that you refer to with social media, Congress has already passed legislation which gives enormous protection to social media that now newspaper has. Mm -hmm. Immunity from libel suits. Uh, section 230. Section, section 230. Right. There, there was a reason for it, but, but the, the fact is, that's the, that's the law now. Yeah, but the, so, I... so Facebook you know, just can't be sued for you putting on your website, on Facebook, something defamatory about someone else. Because a decision was made by Congress, which by the way, both... Uh, 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 Biden opposed in the last campaign and Trump opposed in the last campaign. But that section of federal law, section 230 of the Federal Communications Act, gives enormous immunity because Congress accepted, and, and it's undeniable, the reality that if Facebook ha has to pass on the way the Times does, the accuracy of what all of its users say, it simply can't be, it can't play the role it plays uh, in American life. Now, I'll listen carefully if anybody says, thanks a lot. I'd still rather not have yeah. uh, the social media have that authority, but we just have to understand that if, if we abandon the, the immunity again, that no press organization has. If we abandon that, we're abandoning the whole basis on which social media can carry what you write without it deciding whether it's likely enough true 
that they should take the risk of, of carrying it. And that's, that's a whole new world. But the difference is that Facebook can actually deplatform you. Yes. Right. They can, they can kick a president off. They can kick anyone off. They're just yeah. not making it available. The Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and I don't want to get into a debate on this, but it is a fascinating question, which is, we gave you the immunity because we tried to give you the incentive to build this internet. We loved the idea. We didn't know what the hell the internet was, but we loved this thing called the super information highway. Build it. So don't worry. We're going to give you an immunity. No one can sue you. And the reason we're giving you immunity is because we don't assume that you care what's on the internet. But what we learned is that X, you, they do care what's on the, we thought they didn't care. We well, thought look, they were just- I wanted innocent. Facebook to make decisions not to carry child pornography, even when it is legally de defensible. I want, I want social media not to carry a lot of the worst stuff that it does carry routinely. And if the law becomes that they're responsible, I mean, it's not crazy, if the law becomes they're responsible for all of it, the answer will be, yes, they, they won't carry that, and they won't carry lots and lots right. of other stuff as well. And that's the choice so far we've made and uh, if we change it, uh, it's not a First Amendment change. Let's take two questions from the audience. Uh, We're going to take, of course, please uh, make your questions brief. I'm, I'm just going to start with one question um, to Yael. Um, this is such an important film for people to see. Um, and how, what efforts are being made to get this film and these kind of conversations out there to the public? Yeah, what about that? <laughs> he wants to go on the road. So the film was the film premiered on PBS in late September, um, and was available on streaming for um, 30 days. It's now available through Passport on PBS. But we've just started our educational and what we call non-theatrical outreach to schools, universities, law firms, organizations, press, um, newspapers, all kinds of. Um, not-for-profit and kind of smaller commercial organizations. So if you know of anyone who would be interested, they can go to the film website, speakingfreelyfilm.com, and we're organizing screenings around the country. We're particularly interested in working with universities, especially now, um, to use the film as a way to hopefully depolarize a little bit the conversation that is going on. Um, so, that, so thank you for that. Isaac, you handle that, right? Here we have a mic. Thank you so much uh, for being here, uh, Mr. Abrams, and for the fascinating film. Um, I'm interested in what you think about the logic put forward by Justice Frankfurter in 1952 in Boharnay versus Illinois, uh, the group libel idea. Because it seems to me that you know we all have the right to free speech, but we also have the right to uh, conduct business. We have the right to vote. We have the right to participate in politics and to associate with those. We have a lot of other rights, among them being free speech. Um, and oftentimes, uh, our rights, all of our other rights can be threatened when, um, for example, people create propaganda saying that you know, Jews are money grabbers and you shouldn't hire them in your stores because they'll, they'll ruin your businesses and they need to be sort of eliminated from the public sphere. So, so what about the argument that we can, we can restrict speech if we can articulate how, in a longer term way, not, not that something is incitement and that Jews are instantly gonna be lynched, but that the, the propagation of certain messages through society will lead to you know, documentable uh, decreases in job prospects and all kinds of things like that. Um, so sort of longer range harms that groups experience. Floyd, I just want, the, the, he is not a plant. I know you think, I know you think I put, a, I just love this kid, but it's not mine. Yeah. Look, I'm not, I'm not going to go much beyond saying that's a really hard issue. Uh, 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 but, you know, uh, you go a little farther than that. Uh, well, let me just say, in the movie, Yael, there's, remember that wonderful moment where it says, fighting words and true threats? There's actually, you have the language and you have it. And what, what's not in there what's, is that we don't really, we have these tools like the Boharnay tool. We have tools, 
but we don't use those tools because we're very free speech oriented. That's true. Right? Isn't that true? The yeah. tools are there. Like, this is why you don't like my last book. I keep saying, well, there's the fighting words doctrine and the true threats doctrine. Why aren't we using them? This young man says there's a Bohar name. They're there to stop things that could cause harm. And you would just say, I'm just, you, as you've said so beautifully, you're scared to give anyone the power to make that decision. I'm going to call on you. Uh, you would you question. believe I gave him a blurb uh, uh, for, no. for all of his complaining? Yeah. Yes, please, please. It's such a privilege because I've been, a, ever since I was in law school and took a, a free speech course in law school way back in the 1960s, uh, I've so admired your work on free speech. But <laughs> these days... Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> All right, that guy yeah. I know. Yeah. But, but that said, uh, I feel like I want to be sec secure in my papers in my home and they, and when somebody like the Donald the great Donald who's everybody knows is a dictator trying to be the, our dictator and end our liberties here I need I want to be protected from him and I, I don't want him running for president I want him in prison I will not feel safe until the Donald is in prison that's just how I I guess it, I know it's selfish on my part but I don't think Criminals have any right to run for the president of the United States. Would you like to have a trial? Uh, uh, well, but, but you, can I just say, you've just asked a very fascinating question that's going to be very distressing to some of you. Would you represent Donald Trump in the gag order cases? Because we just heard uh, there was an argument because he's basically saying, uh, what I'm saying is political. And if I'm saying political things, you can't, I'm running for the presidency. You, you can't stop me from saying them. And I thought, should we ask Floyd? I know you don't like the man, but you, I think you do think the gag orders are a little overbroad. Yes, and I would never represent them. <laughs> uh, and in, and in I, fact, I mean, you, really, signed, you signed the letter. There's no, what? You signed the letter. The, the, the incitement, the letter about incitement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I am one of the people who has signed a, uh, a letter, a document, saying that, that he shouldn't be allowed to run for president because of that language in the 14th Amendment, which, which we rely upon. Uh, that, that is, he is, an, you know, he, and he's now been found to have participated in an insurrection Colorado judge uh, ruled that last week, uh, but the Colorado judge then said that for certain other reasons she didn't have the power to keep him from from running. But uh, you know, lawyers don't have to represent. I, I'm, I'm not joking at myself, and certainly not, not to your question. We, we, lawyer doesn't have to represent everybody, uh, even if you have the chance to do so. And I, I, I wouldn't think of representing you. Let's take one more, and then we'll say good night. Uh, you make you, this is your audience. Yes, Juliet's making her way up. Can, can we have? So I just want to point out there's someone in the audience by the name of Steve Pico who was. Oh yes. Who um who as a high school student sued his school board for the right to um to see books that they were trying to ban. So um, and that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And Floyd wrote an amicus brief for that case. So thank you for being here. And I thank think you, you should ask a question. I, I, number one, I never heard Floyd say that the First Amendment was easy. And I think he has just simply been trying to inform us that he believes that the Constitution and the First Amendment are alive, that, that they're living documents, and that they need to grow. Um, I have a separate question, but I think the importance of defending the right of people you disagree with to march, for example, or to speak. It's very important to stand up and defend the rights of others. And that's something that's lacking today. I'm not Jewish, but I took, when I saw that Malamud and Vonnegut were being attacked and were being banned, I took that to the Supreme Court. I defended um, Isaac Asimov. I did a readout with him when his books were banned. 
I defended Studs Terkel when his books were attacked. I just think it's very important to stand up for the rights of others, even if you disagree with them, and he's a champion of that. My question is different, uh, so maybe I am a plant in the audience. Um, my question is, very briefly, are there justices in your lifetime who you believe shared your view of free speech in the First Amendment? Oh, I, I do. Uh, uh, and I learned from them, from reading uh, them. Uh, I think Justice Brennan did. Um, I think Justice Kennedy did. Um, uh, Potter Stewart has, uh, was a strong defender uh, of the First Amendment. Um, uh, I mean, there, there are, you know, a number, a number of others who come to mind uh, uh, immediately. Uh, I don't think we've lacked for. We haven't had enough uh, justices who cared in the in the way that you do. We haven't had enough people in this country who cared the way you do about defending the First Amendment. And we're very fortunate that you're here today and that you're saying and doing what you've said and done through the years. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to close out the evening. Our, our next event is December 3rd. There's a off-Broadway play uh, of Sabbath Theater based on the novel, Philip Roth's novel. It's got John Turturro and Elizabeth Marvel starring in it. So we're, it, we're just going to have a post uh, a performance conversation on December 3rd at that theater. Uh, Yael Floyd, wonderful night. Yael, phenomenal film. Tell your friends about this movie. Floyd, you are a legend and a lion, and we always appreciate you on every possible level to share your presence with us. Good night, everyone. Thank you. I want to give a big thank you to Thane. I also want to thank uh, Olivia Simon, the uh, managing director of uh, of our partners here tonight, and uh, at Folks. Um, please join us for other events, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs>